following program is closed captioned for the thinking impaired. Good afternoon. Yes, are you hiring? Mm, well, maybe... What is your name? Jenny. Are you looking for immediate position or maybe... In this is the massage and escort service, correct? Yes, yes. Jenny, uh, you live in Manhattan? Yes, I do. You are, um, how old are you? I'm 22. I see. How do you look? I'm beautiful. I have long red hair. Uh-huh. And three good teeth. Uh-huh, uh-huh. How tall are you? How tall am I? Mm -hmm. I'm 5'7". 5'7". Hmm. Are you uh, slim? Very slim. Very slim. I have big breasts, too. How many pounds you weigh for five feet seven? I'm 105 pounds. Oh, you slim, yeah. Is, um, uh, are you uh, black or white? I'm white. You are white. Okay. I've got red hair all the way down. Uh-huh, that's beautiful. And down there, too, I'm naturally red. Oh, you are a redhead. Right? Yes. I see. Not, no. You don't no. find those around no, no, not too many, no. I have a very deep pussy, too. I don't know if that counts. Uh, well, uh... I really need some extra money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... I used to be a 976 girl, but I'd like to get into the escort massage business. You used to be what? I want to see the action. But you used to be what? A 976 girl. I used to call men up on the phone and give them sex over the phone. Oh, I see. So I can really turn a man on. I see. I only have one leg. Does that matter? And you have what? I have a prosthetic leg. Does that count? Uh, it looks real. No one can tell the difference. Uh, it can come off, and men really enjoy that. Do you have what? I'm sorry. I don't understand what you are saying. I have a fake leg, but I have a one that looks real, and I can take it off and spin it around. Men really get off on that. You mean a leg? Yes, a leg. You know, the ones you walk on? Yeah, yeah. You have... You don't have a... You have only one leg. I see. I like to sit on their dick and they can spin me around. Mm -hmm. Well, Jenny, you seem very talented. I can smoke cigarettes for my pussy, too. Does that count as a well, good qualification? Well, everything you're saying sounds very qualified. So I imagine that... Uh, uh, we will consider, okay? Would you like me to come in for an audition? Mm, no, not right at the time being. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I met Karen years ago. Man, she was a sight. I'd whip up some dinner, but she wouldn't touch a bite. We'd go out for picnics, maybe a late night snack. I thought it was a good arrangement, but now she's paying me back. Karen Carpenter, I'm fat because of you. Cause I'd eat all your food when you were through. You just have a little bite. I'd eat enough for two Karen Carpenter I'm fat because of you She'd be finished eating i say we've only just begun I'd say I'll sit close to you Cause I'd hate to eat and run Karen, she'd eat like a bird I'd eat like a pig Karen met her maker and I just got real big Karen Carpenter I'm fat because of you Cause I'd eat all your food When you were through You just have a little bite I'd eat enough for two Karen Carpenter I'm fat because of you I would have shared my pudding I'd have given you my meat Had I known that you'd be gone I would have made you eat We were on top of the world You could sing so well 
Now you're in rock and roll heaven, and I'm in Weight Watchers hell. Karen Carpenter, I'm fat because of you. Cause I'd eat all your food when you were through. You just have a little bite, I'd eat enough for two. Karen Carpenter, I'm fat because of you. Rusty Lewis with his tribute to Karen Carpenter. Before that, the 976 Girls and Are You Hiring? Hi, welcome to podcast number 15 in the Brain Sandwich series. My name is Mike Madonna, and I'll be bringing you more of the same kind of stuff you've been accustomed to hearing if you've downloaded the first 14 plus our holiday programs. And with podcast number 14, we came to a conclusion on the Dead Men Prowl series from uh, Adventures by Morse. Uh, It took us 10 podcasts to get the whole thing done. I'll be doing one now from I Love a Mystery, which, uh, again, it was one of my favorite shows, Uh, also by Carlton E. Morse. And uh, this one is called The Thing That Cries in the Night, and uh, it was the very first one I ever heard. The Thing That Cries in the Night, they filmed as a movie back in 1966, theatrically. Um, It was just called I Love a Mystery. It starred David Hartman, Les Crane, and I can't think of the other actor, but uh, Ida Lupino was in it. She's playing the part of the grandmother in the movie that uh, you'll be hearing in the series here. So I'm going to do five chapters per podcast because it's a 15-chapter serial. And uh, the thing is, these things are are short. They run 10 or 11 minutes each. So uh, I'm going to pack five of them into the next three, well, this podcast and the next two until we get through that. And then we'll see where it goes from there. So here is uh, chapter one and chapter two of The Thing That Cries in the Night on The Brain Sandwich Show. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery, transcribed. Yes, sir, Jack. A bunch of doggone heroes. Every doggone one of us. Oh, oh, look here, Doc. Yeah, I know how you feel, Reggie. I wouldn't believe it myself. Only here it is, spread over the front pages of every newspaper in the country. (laughs) You believe everything you read? Of course I do. A newspaper wouldn't dare print anything that wasn't true. (laughs) Doc, you haven't done a thing but read those papers since they were taken on at San Francisco. Very interesting reading, too. Look at this picture of me. Doc Long, the modern Tarzan, who slew a mountain lion with his bare hands. All right, Tarzan, fold up the newspapers. (laughs) What do you mean, fold up the newspaper? Stop reading that stuff before you begin to believe it. Remember, Reggie and I have got to go on living with you. Well, what's that got to do with it? You keep patting yourself on the back, and you're going to break your arm, and we're going to have to feed you again. Hey, you know something that makes me kind of mad? I thought you weren't mad at anybody. Well, looky, we took on a new stewardess at San Francisco... And she ain't even give us a tumble. Why should she? Why, a pretty girl like her, she'd ought to be interested in a bunch of he-fighters like us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, look, Doc, you bored the other stewardess from Seattle to San Francisco with your story. Will you let this girl alone? Oh, all right. Of course, if she asks me, I'm going to have to tell her. Well, she won't ask you if she knows what's good for her. Doggone, I can't get over The insurance company are giving us 25,000 potatoes. Just for bringing Alexander Archer back alive. 25,000 good round simoleons. It was little enough. If Richard Cooper had killed Archer, the insurance company would have been out a million. Yeah. And now here we are on our way to Hollywood to live like three doggone kings. I still don't know why you wanted to come to Hollywood. Well, Hollywood is good as any place else to spend 25,000 smackers, ain't it? Yes, I suppose so. But, Doc, uh, we really don't have to spend it, do we? Of course we do. What good's 25,000 if we don't spend it? Mm-hmm. You agree with him, Jack? Well, it's certainly true that he won't be good for anything else until the money's gone. Mm, quite. And it is a bother. Oh, it ain't gonna be no bother to me. <laughs> 
Not for long, it ain't. What's the best hotel in Los Angeles? Oh, there's several. Yeah, but the most expensive. I don't know. Well, anyway, that's where we're going. Yeah, but, Doc, we're not dressed for that sort of thing. We then have... we'll get dressed for it. And we'll get the most expensive automobile we can find and eat in the most expensive eating places and go to the most expensive shows. And the 25000 will last us just about one month. Well, that's just about right. I don't think I could stand being so darn expensive much longer than that. <laughs> Do you like it, Reggie? Well, as a matter of fact, I don't. Now, there's gratitude for you. I work out a swell way to spend our 25000 Well, just think, Reggie. Folks are waiting on us. Breakfast in bed. Waiting, uh, waiting around in pretty women up to our armpits. I was wondering when that was coming out. <laughs> pretty women? Yes. But Jack, that's the best part of the whole idea. Why, there ain't nothing I like... We know there isn't anything you like as much as a pretty woman. Well, they ain't. There's one thing, though. I'm just wondering with so much whoopee if I'm going to be able to get home every morning in time to have breakfast in bed. <laughs> <laughs> Looky, you fellas. Promise me something? Well, let's hear it first. I want you two to promise me, no matter what happens. No matter what, you get me? That we ain't going to take no adventure nor solving a mystery nor nothing like that. Until until every last penny of the $25,000 is gone. I see. You don't want business to interfere with pleasure. You bet I don't. You promise? Well, now, that's a funny thing to ask, Doc. Adventure just doesn't come up and smack you in the face. You've got to go out looking for it. Yeah, but I know Jack. He smells something and away we go. But if we do run into something... No, sir. If we run right smack into something, we're going to turn our backs and start walking the other way. Well, what do you say to that, Jack? I say the worst is about to happen. Huh? Well, what you mean? That stewardess has spotted us. She's coming this way with a newspaper in her hand. Hey, that's all right. Well, get ready, Reggie, to hear the story of our great adventure all over again. Mm, quite. Hello, honey. Are you Mr. Law? Oh, that's all right. Just call me Doc. Oh, I say. Then this is your picture in the paper. Yep, that's right. And, uh, these other two men... Yep, Jack Packard and Reggie York. Oh, but it's wonderful. You're the three who were almost murdered and fought those mountain lions. Yeah, w would you like to hear about it? Dog. Oh, please. And that poor girl, Linda Joyce. You were wonderful to save her from the mountain lion the way you did. Oh, shucks. It wasn't nothing. Uh, sit down a minute and I'll tell you all about it. Oh, will you please do? It's his pleasure. You know what that? I say you don't know what you're letting yourself in for. Hey, Jack, she asked me, not you. That dreadful Richard Cooper and Dr. Thorne. Thank goodness they're safely in jail. Yeah, they're locked up so tight they ain't never going to get out. But there were so many of them. I mean, beside the two leaders. How did you ever get off the island? Well, while me and Linda was out fighting a lion, Jack and Reggie here captured Cooper and Thorne and locked the rest of the gang up in one of the rooms down in the cellar. Oh, you two should be so proud of yourselves. Hey, uh, what about me out there fighting a the lion? Yeah, but after all, you did have a knife. It wasn't a very big knife. And anyway, I've heard that mountain lions are cowardly. <laughs> hey, when I got through with that cougar, I was in the hospital for two weeks. You don't look like you'd ever been sick a day in your life. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, I swear to Grandma, I ain't never seen a girl like you before. Ain't you impressed at all? Of course I am. The way Mr. York and Mr. Packard locked up 13 men single-handed... I think it's wonderful. Yeah, but maybe you don't understand about mountain lions. Mr. Packard, what happened after you locked those men up? Well, we found Alexander Archer and, and loaded him into the launch with Cooper and Thorne and brought them into court for us and turned them over to the authorities. Oh, but what about all the men that were locked down in that underground room? Oh, the police went out the island and got them. Well, well I suppose you know you're famous. Well, newspapers have to print something, I suppose. But I still don't see why they made so much of Mr. Long and the mountain lion. Hey, look, are you just plain trying to make me mad? Why, no. Of course not. Well, whether you believe it or not, fight, fighting mountain lions ain't no child's play. Oh, Pooh. My folks live on a mountain ranch up in Washington. My mother scares mountain lions out of her chicken yard by shushing her apron at them. Hey, that ain't so. I beg your pardon. Well, hey, I, I didn't mean to say that. I, I'm sorry. Don't only... apologize. I shouldn't have come back here. Yeah. Yeah. But my mother did too scare mountain lions with her chicken apron. So there. <laughs> Well, what are you two are sitting there grinning about? Too bad Cooper didn't arm you with a kitchen apron instead of a knife, Doc. All right, all right. So it's funny. Now I come to think of it, Reggie, I wonder if maybe Linda didn't scare that lion to death by shaking her skirts yes, at Yes, quite. But in that case, how did Doc get those scratches and bruises? He might have fallen down a ravine. Yes, that would account for it, all right. Well, you two guys shut up. Well, naturally, he couldn't say that Linda killed the cougar. Well, naturally not. Look, you two smart guys. I beg your pardon? Yeah. I'm a passenger on the plane. Well, so what? You look like the fella whose picture I got here in my paper. See? Oh, okay, so I'm the fella. What about it? Is it true you killed the mountain lion with your bare hands? No. You think? 
But it's right here in the paper. I can't help that. Then that mountain cougar's still alive? No, he ain't. He died of being scared to death. My goodness, you don't tell me. Sure I'm telling you. My mama come along and waved her kitchen apron at him, and he laid right down and kicked the bucket. Young man, you're a liar. Oh, you don't believe me. That's a fine way to talk to a gentleman. Well, if you don't believe me, just go back and ask the stewardess. She knows all the answers. Are you, gentlemen, this feller's companion? <laughs> yes. What's the matter with him? Well, he hasn't been quite right ever since we left the island. Oh, so that's it. Too bad. Too bad. Why, that gum, you jack. <laughs> Find a pair of sippy cats as I ever tied up with. Don't worry, Doc. There'll be a new batch of newspapers with stories in them when we reach Hollywood. Well, don't you say newspapers to me. Oh, look here now, Doc. I'm warning you. The first newsboy that sticks a newspaper under my nose is going to get smacked right back three generations. <laughs> oh, I say, look down. Lights. You must be getting in. Fasten your safety belts, please. So your mama shushed a cougar with her apron. Yes, yeah, she did. Fasten your safety belts. First thing she knows, she's going to have herself to leave in that. Oh, talk. <laughs> yeah, we're heading into the field. Well, there we are. Back on solid ground again. Well, there she is, folks. Burbank, California. Come on, let's get out of here and start spending some of that money. What do we do? Take a taxi? We're doggone right. To the most expensive hotel in Los Angeles. Some place that's close to Hollywood, though. Watch your step, please. Watch your step, please. Your mom is sure enough scared a cougar with her apron. You're holding up the passengers. Please move along. Oh, so you're backing down there. I am not. Well, Doc, come on. Well, all I got to say is that your mama's one tough home. Oh, you're impossible. Take his arm, Reggie. I'm a coming. Watch your step, please. A cute kid. Just as soon lies. Look at you, though. Quite a crowd outside the gate. Grant's got a little plane ready, getting ready to go out. I beg your pardon. Are you Mr. Jack Packard and party? Yes, that's right. This way, if you please. Yeah, wait a minute. Who are you? I'm the chauffeur. If you'll just get in that big black car over there, I'll pick up your baggage. Man, oh, man. Look here. It's a block long. Well, what's it all about? We didn't order anyone to meet us. You must be mistaken. You said your name was Mr. Packard. That's right. Well, then, if you'll please get in the car, I'll, I'll be right back with the luggage. Jack, I don't get it. Well, neither do I. Well, what do we care? Look here. It's what's in that a big old automobile. What's that? I ask you, did you ever see a prettier arm full of girl than that? No. Let's climb in. What are we waiting for? transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Casting System presents I Love a Mystery. Transcribed. Don't we get ourselves in the most expensive places? Looky, Jack. Looky, Reggie. Silk sheets, even. All right, silk sheets. So what? So I'm a going to sleep between silk sheets for the first time in my life. 
Honest to my grandma, fellas, if my cousin Winnie May could see me now. What makes you think we're going to be here long enough to sleep between any kind of sheets? What you mean? We've been brought here, ain't we? I still think there's been some mistake. I say, Jack, what's that? Oh, where have you been? Oh, prowling a bit. Did you two know there's a suite of three bedrooms with separate baths? Well, didn't I tell you this was expensive stuff? We got ourselves in a bedroom for each of us. Sure, so what you mean, Jack, by saying it's a mistake? Well, there's no sense to anything that's happened so far. We get on a plane to come to Hollywood for the express purpose of spending $25,000. Well, we can spend it from here just as good as any place else. Well, that's not the point. Ain't, huh? No, it isn't. The point is, when we get off the plane, we're met by a liveried chauffeur in a fancy car, just as though we were expected and being met by appointment. No explanation, nothing. We're just invited to get in the car. That's right, and so we get in the car. And why? Well, because there's a good-looking girl waiting inside, inside for us. Well, that's as good a reason as any for getting into a strange auto. Are you sorry you did it? Well, look what it's got us in so far. Yeah, but that isn't the idea, Doc. We've been driven out to this beautiful old Hollywood mansion, and we don't know why. All we know is that this is the home of Randolph Martin. Yeah, whoever he is. And that these are to be our quarters, and the dinner will be served at seven. Hey, well, we know the name of the little old honey pot who met us at the airport. Faye Martin. Does that mean anything to you? No, of course not. <laughs> Except I like knowing it. Why? Because I think I'm going to like Faye when we get to know each other better. You're out of your class, Doc. What you mean, out of my class? If this house is any indication, the Martins are not only wallowing in money, but they're overflowing with the refinements and niceties of an old family. Aristocrats? If you look about, you see signs of the family tree almost everywhere. You mean we're going to be high-hatted? What happened in the car on the way out here? Huh? Well, what you mean, what happened? Why, the minute we began asking Miss Faye Martin questions, she froze sullen. Yeah, only I just thought she's kind of nervous on account of us being strangers. Besides, you don't think I ain't man enough to unfreeze her? <laughs> you still don't get it, Doc. She was the uh, little princess keeping the village yokels in their place. Well, then what'd we come for? Oh, oh see here now. No, Doc. sir. I'll be doggone if I'll stay around folks who don't think I'm as good as they are. All right, Doc. Relax, will you? The whole point is that we allowed that girl to bring us from the airport to this house without getting one bit of information out of her. We allowed ourselves to be turned over to the butler in the downstairs hall and conducted to these rooms, still not knowing what it's all about. And now we've been here for an hour, and what do we know? Well, I'll tell you what we know. What? We know that we're being neglected. That's what we know. Yes, and that's about all. Well, why don't we do something about it? We don't have to stand around with our teeth in our mouth. We ain't locked in. Let's bust out and find this here Randolph Martin. No, that's not the answer. Well, why the heck ain't it? Well, don't you agree with me, Reggie? Get aggressive and show them that we ain't folks to be pushed around. Mm, no, no, I, I don't think so. Hey, what's the matter with you two anyway? Oh, look here, Doc. Gentlefolk might not understand our strong arm methods. Gentlefolk? People of breeding. Refinement. Hey, look, you think I'm purdy enough to sit down at the table with these folks tonight? <laughs> oh, look here. After all, we didn't come here of our own accord. They brung us. Now, just the same, Doc. I think we can wait until dinner. Oh, sure, we can wait until next week. But that ain't spending none of that $25,000 reward money we've come to Hollywood to spend. But we're bound to meet the whole family at dinner, and then the reason for our being here, if there is a reason, will come out. I say, who is this uh, Randolph Martin, anyway? Well, I never heard of him. You, Jack? No. No, he can't be anyone. Oh, someone showing some signs of interest. Well, how doggone gracious of him not to forget us completely. I get it. Hello. Oh, good evening. I'm Jack Packard. Look. Somebody slashed me. Slashed you? Yes. Here, on my arm. Here, let me see that. Now, maybe you better come in here. Yes, I guess maybe I'd better. And you're bleeding all over the carpet. Come into the bathroom and hold your arm over the basin. All right. Reggie, close the door. Quiet. I say, Doc, did you see that? Yeah, what's going on here? What's she mean, somebody slashed Well, her? she was probably well bleeding. Well, who the heck suppose she is? Oh, Doc. Yeah? Bring me some iodine and cotton and some adhesive tape out of my bag. Okay, uh, coming right up. It isn't really very much of a cut. About an inch long, not too deep. Now, how'd it happen? They did it. They? Yes. I was walking down the hall. I felt a kind of sharp sting on my arm. I looked at it quick, and it was all bloody. This happened just now, out in the hall? Yes. Who was out there with you? I turned around real quick, but there wasn't anybody. Here's the stuff you wanted. No, thanks. Hmm. They don't amount to much with blood washed off. But how'd it happen? They did it. Well, you keep saying they. Who are they? I don't know. They just won't let me alone, is all I know. Yeah? Well, what did bothering you for? I don't know. I think they're trying to kill me. Kill you? Hey, wait a minute. What did anybody want to kill a nice girl like you for? I don't know. Now then, this might sting a little. I'm pouring iodine in the cup. I don't mind pain. Good girl. There it is. 
Now, little cotton, it's some adhesive tape, and you're all well again. Now, look here, Jack. Didn't you hear her say someone's trying to kill her? Yes, I heard her. Do you mind telling us your name? I'm Cherry Martin. Cherry, huh? It's really Charity. But nobody calls me that. Then you must be the sister of Faye Martin, who met us at the airport. Yes. She likes Faye best, but her name's really Faith. There you are. Now come out in the other room. You're still pretty much upset. No. I'm not upset. Well, then why that fearful whisper? I'm afraid they'll hear me. Please sit down. No. No, I mustn't. I must go now. But see here, I think you should sit down and tell us about this if you're in danger. That must be the reason why we're here. Yes, that's part of the reason. But I must go now. But ain't you scared to go out in that hall? If somebody got to just slashing your arm, ain't he liable to do it again? Yes. Then why not stay here where we can look out for no, you? No. I mustn't stay. Well, why? I just mustn't. That's all. Would you like someone to walk to your room with you? No. I'm all right. Oh, yes, I almost forgot. Hope is my other sister. I say. Faith, hope, and charity. Yes. She's the one who's in the worst danger. Hope and my brother, Job. Your sister, Hope, and your brother, Job, are in the worst danger? Yes. From what? From whom? I don't know. But they do. I'll see you at dinner. Well, smack me for a baby. What goes on? Well, now things are beginning to make sense. The reason for our being here begins to emerge. Danger, murder, fear. In this house? There's your blue-blooded aristocracy you fellas was holding your breath over. Oh, it's more apparent than ever, don't you think, Jack? I mean, to say the exquisite refinement of that girl's face. The roots of an old family tree are firmly entrenched in this house. Yes, Reggie, but it's also apparent that the family tree is beginning to show signs of decay. Signs of decay? Looks to me like it was rotten clean down to the roots. Mm, something's belly wrong, all right. Screw a family in the beginning. Who ever heard of naming girls Faith, Hope, and Charity? Sounds like a Texas camp meeting. Well, at least we know this much now. There are three sisters who've gone to the names of Fay, Hope, and Cherry. And there's a brother, Job. Yeah, there's another name out of this world. And it appears, according to Cherry's story, that someone is molesting her with the intent eventually to kill her. Yeah, and right in this house, too. Funny kind of a cut she had on her arm. What kind of a knife would make a thin, long cut like that? Well, Dr. Scalpel, safety razor blade. I say, that's exactly what it looked like, a safety razor blade cut. Yeah, but who's going around murdering folks with an old safety razor blade? What do you do with your old safety razor blades? <laughs> but this must be pretty doggone serious, Jack. Cherry thinks they're out to kill her, yet she says her sister Hope and her brother are even, in even worse danger. I'd, I'd like to get hold of that Randolph Martin and give him a piece of my mind. His children are in danger, and he keeps us up here waiting. He doesn't tell us what it's all about, and he, why doesn't he let us get on to it? Did you ever stop to think... Listen. You say, a blooming infant in the house. Yeah, then one of the girls must be Mary. Open the door, Doc. Well, what for? Ain't you never heard a baby holler before? Never mind, open the door. Okay. All I hope is he don't yell at night. Has a fine pair of lungs. Stuffed a nipple in its mouth or something. <laughs> Jack, I say. Come on, what are we waiting for? Here, here's the stairs. And there she is lying down at the foot. Come on. Oh, doggone. Here, wait a minute. Straighten her out. Uh, oh, hey, it's Jerry. Is she dead? No. No, she's not dead. No. I'm not dead. But well, hey, she, she's conscious. And after it tumbled down all them stairs. All right, what is it this time? Oh, well, hey. Well, why are you all standing there gaping? What is it? Your daughter just fell downstairs. My granddaughter, you mean. Is she hurt? No. No, I'm not hurt. Oh, falling downstairs. I didn't fall. Somebody pushed me. Hey, they, they did? What's that bandage on your arm? Somebody slashed me. <laughs> Can you stand? Yes. I think so. And get to your feet. Here, uh, l let me help you. Uh, huh? There you are. Thank you. Perhaps I should explain how we happen to be here. I know more about that than you do, young man. You do? I should. I brought you. Then you're... Randolph Martin. And I need help. I'm having granddaughter trouble. <laughs>
the further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Okay, chapters one and two of The Thing That Cries in the Night, and we'll get three more in before the end of the program here. But let's move along. Here is the instructional record of the show. This is something that we played on the radio some years ago, and we had a contest where we uh, wrote up, um, based on the language and the CB instruction album, uh, it was a, sort of like a treasure map. The person that won the contest, you know, by following and understanding all the clues, won a tin of wartime civil defense crackers that uh, was found in the basement of the building we were broadcasting from. So, anyway, here's How to CB, Part 1, on the Brain Sandwich Show. These are the sounds of your new party line, CB or Citizens Band Radio. It has a language of its own, your new language, as you use and get to know your CB. Today, the uses of Citizens Band Radio are limitless. Units of all descriptions can be found in business establishments, recreational vehicles, your car, boat, small aircraft, literally anywhere short-distance communications are desirable. Base units provide a line of contact between the motorist, his home or office, and also a means of communication with other base units. Commercial services use Citizens Band Radio to dispatch vehicles and to check scheduling. Other services, such as ski patrols, surveyors, highway maintenance crews, and farmers use two-way CB radio communications to boost efficiency and save time. Now that you know where you can use your CB radio, it's about time I told you what you need to operate. First, you must have an FCC license, available for $4 from the Federal Communications Commission in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Appropriate licensing information is packed with your new CB unit. There are basically two different categories of CB transceivers, mobile or base units. Mobile units are compact, operating on either 6 or 12 volts, which can be supplied by your car's battery. Base units, usually found in the home or office, have a built-in power supply for use on normal household current. In some cases, base transceivers are capable of serving as both base and mobile stations. A radio of this dual type is quite useful in motor homes where you can use DC power while mobile and AC power when hooked up to a generator. There are two types of CB transceivers. Some are manufactured to operate in just the AM mode, while others are capable of operating in both AM and SSB FM modes. The majority of CB radios operate in the AM mode only. These units have from 3 to 23 channels. On the other hand, single sideband transceivers operate on all 23 AM channels, plus an additional 46 on FM, for a total of 69 available channels. Of course, single sideband units are more complex, and therefore more costly. Before buying a unit, decide carefully which will satisfy your needs. The antenna you select to complete your CB system is of great importance. No matter how expensive or elaborate your transceiver, without a good antenna, your efforts are wasted. By definition, an antenna is a metal whip designed to receive and transmit radio signals within a given area. Just as there are mobile and base units, there are mobile and base antennae of all types and descriptions. When buying your antenna, be sure to check for quality before you make the purchase. I must mention one other type of CB radio, the walkie-talkie, whose major difference is 
that the transmit and receive push to talk switch is on the side of the unit instead of on an external microphone. This, however, does not alter its capabilities. Used under the proper conditions, the walkie-talkie can be and is very effective. Getting to the rules of the road. The FCC calls them Part 95, Citizens Radio Service. You can get a copy from the government printing office in Washington. Part of your licensing procedure involves owning a copy of this Part 95. Even though much of what it contains is of little use to you, still it does have useful information. Here are some of the more important useful points from Part 95. CB, Citizens Band Service, is intended for short-distance personal or business radio communications between CB radios, also called transceivers, whether they are in a fixed place or mobile. To qualify for a CB license, you need to be at least 18 years old. When using your CB, your transmissions, the length of time you speak on the air, should be as brief as possible, never longer than five minutes. Then you must wait one minute before broadcasting again. In an emergency involving safety of life or property, related communications must always be given priority, regardless of the length of transmissions. Emergency communications may not be interfered with. Your CB license call sign has three letters, followed by four digits. KYX 6671. The call sign should be transmitted, spoken clearly, at the beginning and end of each of your transmissions or group of transmissions. This is KFD 2746, I down and on the side. And oh yes, there's one other thing. Channel 9 is for emergency use only. You may also use it for motorist assistance. Things involving a vehicle broken down or a driver needing directions. Channel 9 is monitored full-time by the state police in most states. Break Channel 9. Break, break. Go ahead, break on Channel 9. Come back. Yeah, guy, we've got a four-wheeler broken down at the 118-mile marker on Route 50 northbound. Come back. Yeah, we got a copy on that, uh, guy. Stand by. Uh, help is on the way. Uh, roger. 10-4. Thanks very much. The FCC has designated Channel 11 for calling, establishing contact with another CB station, after which you must switch to another channel to continue talking. Break 1-1, one, one, break. Uh, you might have break, go ahead. How about that Misty Cat one time? Hey, Misty Cat, you got your ears on? Yeah, go put a ear. Uh, this is uh, Misty Cat, uh, I copy, come on back. Hey, Misty Cat, move on down to Channel 8, come back. Hey, that's a big four guy, I'm headed for 8. Truckers have unofficially taken over Channel 19 for discussing road conditions. Break one nine for an eastbound on Route 9. You got an eastbound, come on. You will find that most CBers, like yourself, also monitor Channel 19 for useful road information. Although the FCC has not set rules and regulations, there are common ways to break a channel. Most CBers break in the following way. Break one nine for 1036. Once again, we remind you that Channel 11 is the established calling channel. However, CBers break any channel. You will hear CBers break Channel 11 for a specific person. Once the person responds, the CBers switch to another channel. For example... Break 11 for the heavy Chevy one time. Come back, uh, you got the heavy Chevy. Okay, heavy Chevy, you got the pipeline here. Let's go to Channel 1-9. Then you will hear break 19 for Heavy Chevy, and then Heavy Chevy and Pipeline will transmit their message and stand by. Break 19 one time for that Heavy Chevy, come on. Hey, you got the Heavy Chevy here, come back. Hey, heavy Chevy, Another very familiar break is for the CBer to simply say, break. Another CBer will recognize the break by responding, come back, breaker. At that point. The first CBer asks for the information or person he is looking for. Break one nine. Come on, breaker. We got ourselves a four-wheeler spitting motion motion all over this here flat. It's at one four in the That's a big ten four there, guy. By now, you've heard some of the tens. The ten code being used in CB over-the-air discussions. 
There seems to be difference in meaning for some of the tens, but the meaning of certain tens doesn't change. Everyone agrees these give the same message. For example, 10-4. Ten 10-4 four. Ten four means, yes, I understand, I agree. 10-5. 10-5. Relay this message, or a message to be relayed. 10-6. 10-6. Busy. Please stand by. 10-7. 10-7. Off the air, or radio turned off. Ten eight. Ten eight. On the air and standing by. Ten ten. Ten ten. Usually means message complete. Standing by. Ten thirteen. Ten thirteen. Report of weather or road conditions. Ten twenty. Twenty. Ten twenty or twenty. Location. Ten thirty three. Ten thirty three. Emergency. 1036. 1036. Correct time. 1042. 1042. Traffic accident. We've enclosed a more nearly complete list of the tens and their meanings with this recording. You may want to keep it near your CB set. Most CBers give themselves a name or handle to be used to identify themselves to other CBers on the air. Breaker 1-9, you got the rhinestone cowboy here. You, uh, broke it, uh, now fix the cowboy, come on back. The handle, or name you adopt, should be one of a kind, based on something special in your life. As you listen further, you will hear handles in use in the exercises and dialogues coming up. In addition to handles, here are some CB terms in common use whose meanings you'll find useful. First, you'll hear selected key words or phrases used often in CB transmissions. Then, a definition. And to give you an idea of how each is used in a sentence, an example will follow. Take mental notes. These key words will be used again later in the recording. Advertising. Police car using lights and siren. There's a smokey coming up fast in that $50 lane guy, and he's advertising for sure. Back door. Last vehicle with CB in a group traveling in the same direction. You got the back door now, guy. We'd be beating the bushes for you. Come on. Brown bottle. A bottle of beer. Hey, good buddy. Got time for a brown bottle at the next short short? Camera, Kodak or Polaroid. Radar, used by police. There's one smoke em up there at my marker 131 with a camera and he's taking pictures for sure. Come back. Repeat message. Hey there, Artie Choke. Come back with that 1013. Coupon. Speeding or traffic ticket. Don't let that old smokey be giving you coupons now. Double nickel. 55 miles per hour. Hey there, guy. We be keeping it to a double nickels. Come back. 18-wheeler, tractor-trailer truck. I'll be driving this here 18-wheeler. Four-wheeler, automobile. We'll be hearing this blue four-wheeler guy at your front door. Fairy tale, a story or a report. Hey there, guy. How about a fairy tale about old Papa Bear? Go-go juice or motion lotion, gasoline or fuel. Hey, Skyrider, we got to stop and get some motion lotion for this here four-wheeler. Come back. Gone. Finish transmitting. We gone. Bye bye. Green stamp. Toll road. We got wall to wall smokies on the green stamp for sure. Jake. To slow down. All you 18 wheelers better use the Jake before the piggy bank. We got us a smoky. Mayday. Distress call. Emergency call. Mayday. Mayday. Break 19 for a mayday call. Mercy. Universal synonym for all naughty words that are illegal on the air. Mercy, I just missed my short short. Over your shoulder. The road behind. Hey there, buddy. How's it looking over your shoulder today? Back to that old hole in the wall. Come back. Piggy bank. Toll booth. We got us a smoky in the bushes on the south side of the piggy bank for sure. Ratchet jawing. Talking excessively on the channel. Gee, he's been uh, ratchet jawing on that channel the whole time he's been driving. Rocking chair. 
Middle vehicle with CB in a convoy. Hey, looks like I'll be riding in this here rocking chair for a while, good buddy. Rolling refinery. Gasoline or oil truck. I'd be a rolling refinery broken down by the side of the road. Smokey. Any police officer. We got us a Smokey coming up fast in that $50 lane. Slab. Highway. Hey, God, I've been pounding this here slab since early morning. Tijuana Taxi. Police car that is clearly marked with lights. Hey, guy, you got a Tijuana taxi moving south in that there monster lane. Truck em up lane. Extreme right lane on a highway. We got ourselves a granny in this here truck em up lane, so hammer up there, guy. Now, good buddy, it's time for you to choose your handle, pick up your microphone, and do some ratchet drawing on your own. In these practice exercises, first you'll hear both sides of the two-way conversation. It'll then be repeated. At first, you may want to repeat the messages just like you hear them. After you limber up your jaw, feel free to let your tongue down and hammer away with words that make you feel good. Mercy sakes alive, that's what CB's all about. Now break 19, this is the Green Thumb, KFD 6671. Do I have a copy there? 10-4, uh, Green Thumb, go ahead. This is the Robber Baron, KCW 1152, letting you roll with the channel. Come back. Hey, uh, Green Thumb here is looking for a 1036. Come back. 10-4, gong time is 9.50, and it keeps on ticking. Oh, uh, mercy, about time for me to take a short short. Uh, 10-4 there, Green Thumb, hammer on down to arrest him up, not more than two miles down this here green stamp. Yeah, thank you there, good buddy, I'll catch you on the flip-flop, the Green Thumb is gone, KFD 6671. Have a good gone, Green Thumb, this here's the robber baron looking for a rocking chair, 10-10 till then, KCW 1152. Okay, now I'm going to try it. Break 19, this is the Green Thumb, KFD 6671. Go ahead, Green Thumb. This is the Robber Baron, KCW 1152, letting you roll with the channel. Green Thumb here is looking for a 1036. Gong time is 9.50 and it keeps on ticking. Mercy, about time for me to take a short short. Hammer down to arrest him up not more than two miles down this here green stamp. Thank you, good buddy. I'll catch you on the flip flop. The Green Thumb is gone, KFD 6671. Have a good gone, Green Thumb. This is Robert Barron looking for a rocking chair. 1010 till then, KCW 1152. Now we're going to pick out the important key words. I'll give you their definitions. Don't hesitate to repeat the words. After all, your objective is to learn quickly and correctly. KCW 1152 is your official CB call sign. 1036. Correct time request. Mercy, a term used in place of a stronger word. Hammer down, to accelerate. Flip-flop, return trip. Rocking chair, middle CB vehicle in a line of three or more. Getting a feel for it? Let's try another. Break 19 for the superstar in that four-wheeler, come on. Uh, go ahead, Breaker. I'm at the back door of your four-wheeler car. You've got KCS 8750. Come back. Hey there, guy. This is the yo-yo string. Come back. Hey, how you doing there, yo-yo string? Take a look over your shoulder and give us a smoky report, huh? Heard tell you got a tier one taxi advertising. And if you don't want to see the bears, you better pull your hammer back there, guy. Mercy, that's a big 10-4 for sure. This here superstar's headed for double nickels, and we'll let that Cadillac doing it to it in the monster lane go catch himself a coupon. These local yokels got Kodaks, and they be taking pictures all the way to the state line. Thank you. I'll keep my nose between the ditches and Smokey out of my britches for sure. Stack them eights, yo-yo string. Threes and eights on you, superstar. KFD 4728. We northbound down and on the side. Okay, it's our turn to try it again. Break 19 for the superstar in that four-wheeler, come on. Go ahead, I'm at the back door of your four-wheel car, KCS 8750. This here's a yo-yo string, come back. Okay, yo-yo string, take a look over your shoulder and give me a smoky report. Heard tell you got a tier one taxi advertising, and if you don't want to feed the bears, you better pull your hammer back there, guy. Mercy, the superstar is heading for double nickels, and we'll let that Cadillac doing it in the monster lane catch a coupon. These local yokels got Kodaks, and they be taking pictures all the way to the state line. Thank you. I'll keep my nose between the ditches and Smokey out of my britches. Stack them eights, yo-yo. Threes and eights to you, superstar. 
KFD 4728. We'd be northbound, down, and on the side. Again, pay special attention to the key words. As we review, repeat them after me. Back door. The last vehicle with CB in a group. Over your shoulder. The road behind you. Smokey report. A police report. Tijuana Taxi, a police car with lights and markings. Advertising, a police car with lights and siren running. Double nickels, 55 miles per hour. Monster Lane, passing lane on the extreme left. Coupon, a traffic ticket. Kodaks, radar. Taking pictures. Police using radar. By now, you should have a general idea about the use of CB's language. And it's only natural to assume you're anxious to test out your new unit. But first, you have to know how. The first thing you might want to do is test for clarity and strength of your signal. One way this can easily be done is by asking another CB'er how he's receiving you. To give you an idea of how you should ask for a radio check, Listen to the following example. Break 19 for a radio check comeback. Yeah, come on for that radio check, guy. Thanks for the comeback, guy. What's your 20? How are you reading us? We've got you laying a solid 10 pounds on a solid and wall-to-wall -wall over here on mile marker 1-4 on this route 9. Come back. Hey, that's a 10-4, guy. How's our modulation? Your modulation is mighty crisp and clean. Do you copy? That's a big 10-4, uh, guy. Uh, thanks much for the radio check. 10-4, uh, you got one pit stop man here. Have a good day today and a better day tomorrow. One pit stop man, KKC, 4773, going 10-10 till I get a chance to do it again. Bye. That's a big 10-4, pit stop man. Good numbers to you. You got one, Super Sun, KKQ, 3459, going 10-10. Okay, it's our turn to try it again. Break 19 for a radio check, come back. Yeah, come on for that radio check. Thanks for the comeback, guy. What's your 20? How are you reading us? We got to land a solid 10 pounds on a solid and wall-to-wall -wall over here on mile marker 1-4 on this Route 9. Come back. Uh, that's a 10 four. guy. How's our modulation? Modulation is mighty crisp and clean. Do you copy? That's a big 10 four. guy. Thanks much for the radio check. You got one pit stop man here. Have a good day today and a better day tomorrow. One pit stop man, KKC 4773, going 1010 till I get a chance to do it again. 104 pit stop man, good numbers to you. You got one Super Sun KKQ 3459, going 1010. Remember, always speak clearly and distinctly into the microphone. If you don't, your transmission may be weak or muddy. Also, if you're a new CB'er, your apprehension may affect your voice level. So, Speak up and roll with the channel. For the most part, Citizens Band Radio is used by motorists who need information. All kinds of information. Break 19 for 1013, come on. Break 19 for 1036. Break 19, I need directions to the old bean town, come back. Hey, break 19 for smoke report, come on. For example, in the following dialogue, a motorist is looking for help on channel 19. Hey, break 19 for 1033, come on. Come on back, paper breaker. Hey there, thanks. I got myself a four-wheeler spit in motion motion on this slab here at exit 1-4 on the green stamp, and I'd be looking for a smoky. Come on. Hey, Beaver, the place to get help is on channel 9, and I'll do a 10-5 about that motion lotion all over the slab. Hey, thanks for the comeback, guy. We slide to 9. In this case, the first Mayday call was made on channel 19. As you remember, channel 9 is reserved for emergencies. The responding motorist directed the call to Channel 9, where police assistance is more immediately available. Note also, the responding motorist is going to relay the gasoline on the pavement warning to other CBers. Getting back to this language exercise, let's review the preceding dialogue. Hey, break 19 for 1033. Come on. Come on back, breaker. Hey there, thanks. I got myself a four-wheeler spit in motion motion on this slab here at exit 1-4 on the green stamp, and I'd be looking for a smoky. Come on. Hey, Beaver, the place to get help is on Channel 9, and I'll do a 10-5 about that motion lotion all over this here slab. Hey, thanks for the comeback, guy. We slide to 9. Some of the key words in that Mayday call were 1033, 
emergency call, four-wheeler, an automobile, motion lotion, gas or fuel, slab, a highway, green stamp, a toll road, Smokey, a police officer, 10-5, relay message, Mayday, international distress call. By repeating these words and phrases, your ear as well as your jaw will soon become more accustomed to your new language. Before you know it, you'll be ratchet jawing on the green stamp with the best of them. Part one of How to CB, and part two will be coming up in just a little bit. Let's turn to Red Buttons now, uh, doing one of his famous Friars Club roasts. Uh, the particular victim that night was Cary Grant. Cary, here is what we call an actor's actor, a comedian's comedian, a friend's friend, and a friar's friend, and a friar. The great Mr. Red Buttons. Mr. Rabbit, Mr. Costello, <laughs> you folks notice that all the singers are Italian and all the comedians are Jewish, which is ridiculous because there's very little difference between the Jews and the Italians. One year of high school. <laughs> either way, either way, either way. Thank you, Frank. Wonderful man. Man who once told Ethel Merman to speak up. <laughs> God bless you, Frank. Man with guts. Man who went down to the Russian embassy and sang, look for the union label in Polish. God bless you, Frank. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a distinct privilege and a pleasure to be here tonight for Cary Grant, a man who is not only a friend to me, he's a total stranger. <laughs> but a good man, man with heart man who spends three hours a week in hospitals teaching nervous people how to eat jello. <laughs> God bless you, Kerry. I'm talking about a hell of a man, a man with heart. A man who once took Ray Charles to a Marcel Marceau concert. <laughs> But he wasn't happy with that, so he went to Stevie Wonder's house and rearranged his furniture. <laughs> God bless you, Carrie. I'm here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, because Cary Grant is always there. He is always there. Moving and smiling and charming and giving and helping. The man is there. It doesn't matter where, this man. This man is there. At a small gathering of demented New Guinea aborigines who eat nothing but Hebrew national products. This man was there, moving, smiling, giving, helping. At a Joan Crawford child slapping contest in Selma, Alabama. The man was there, moving and slapping and giving and helping, charming and debbing. The man was there. In Israel, at an expedition of Hadassah housewives, 
who believe that chicken soup can bring the Dead Sea back to life. The man was there. He was pouring and fazuching and giving and moving and taking. Man was there. In New York City at a garment center luncheon for business partners who trust each other. He was there. He was the only one, but he was there. Moving and lunching and hopping and slitting, the man was there. At Masada. You've all seen Masada. It's a phony. You're not going to tell me you're going to put 960 Jews on the top of a mountain without a golf course, a tennis court, a jewelry shop, a Chinese restaurant. I don't believe this. At Masada, at a mass suicide of Jerusalem bellhops who would rather die than carry pigskin luggage. The man was there. He was there. This man was there. In Harlem, at a symposium of Puerto Rican doctors who write all their prescriptions with spray paint, The man was there at a protest rally of the Italian PLO. Pizza, lasagna, and olive oil workers' union who believed that if the Pope were Italian, he would have shot back. The man was there. He was there, he was there, Carrie was there. In Hoboken, New Jersey, at a Sons of Italy prayer meeting for the passage of Frank Sinatra's gaming license. No, the man was there. Praying and moving, he was there. Carrie was there. In the South Bronx, on a sightseeing bus tour for nostalgic German tourists who miss World War II. <laughs> the man was there. God bless you, Carrie, he was there. In Transylvania, at a midnight minion, of orthodox Jewish vampires who will not suck a neck unless they salt it first. <laughs> the man was there. At a full showing of the Bella Abzug designer jeans. That's why this man is getting a dinner. Because some of the biggest people in the history of the world never got a dinner. Adam. Adam who said in the Garden of Eden, I got more ribs, you got more broads. Never got a dinner. A lot who said when his wife was turned into a pillar of salt, salt I got, popcorn I need. <laughs> Never got a dinner. Moses who yelled when the Red Sea parted, what the hell is that? I was just going in for a dip. <laughs> Never got a dinner. 
Noah's wife who said to Noah, don't let the elephants watch the rabbits. <laughs> never, never got a dinner. Flash Gordon who said, no, that's not how I got my name. <laughs> never got a dinner. Amelia Earhart, who said, stop looking for me, see if you can find my luggage. <laughs> Never got a dinner. Nancy Reagan, who said to Jerry Zipkin, what do you wear to a recession? <laughs> Never got a dinner. Could stand up here for a week and name him off Moshe Diane, who donated his eye to CBS. <laughs> Never got a dinner. Mrs. Menachem Begin, who said to Rosalind Carter, No, you can't make matzo balls out of grits. <laughs> Never got a dinner. Bluebeard, who set the Scotland Yard, how do I know how many women I've killed? I'm a murderer, not an accountant. <laughs> Never got a dinner. Joseph Cotton, who said, you know how I got my name? Sammy Davis picked it for me. <laughs> Never got a dinner. Helen of Troy. A hooker from upstate New York. <laughs> who invented the slogan, the buck stops here. Never got a dinner. Tarzan, who said to Bo Derek, you ten? That's cheap. <laughs> Never got a dinner. Yes, my friends, I'm talking about the biggies. Jack the Ripper's mother. Who said to Jack, how come I never see you with the same girl twice? <laughs> never got a dinner. Nostradamus, who predicted he would never get a dinner, never got a dinner. <laughs> the Ayatollah Kakamami, who said in Tehran, you can call me Aya, or you can call me Tola, or you can call me Mimi, but don't you call me Kaka. Never got a dinner. Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter who said to Pope John, next time, bring the missus. <laughs> That's why he's back in planes playing with his nuts. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow once said, we judge ourselves by what we feel capable of doing, while others judge us by what we have already done. Cary Grant has done plenty to brighten up our lives. We love you, Cary. From the Friars Club in New York City, that was Red Buttons Roasting Cary Grant. have a few more of those that I'll be putting into future podcasts. Anyway, let's move along. Uh, chapters 3 and 4 in the I Love a Mystery series, The Thing That Cries in the Night, on the Brain Sandwich Show. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery, transcribed.
Crow. Then, Mr. Packard, we'll go into the library. Mrs. Martin, will you tell me why you sent Doc and Reggie back up to our quarters? I'm taking you into the library to meet my granddaughters. What's that got to do with Doc and Reggie? My dear man, you don't know my granddaughters. What's that? No. When there are too many eligible men about, it's difficult to get them to concentrate on anything else. Man crazy, huh? Keep a civil tongue in your head. <laughs> you suggested it. I can say what I please about my granddaughters. You can't. I see. Be sure you do. The Martin girls can do no wrong. But you were telling me a few moments ago you were having granddaughter trouble. I am. Well, isn't it going to be a little difficult for us to discuss the trouble if I've got to assume the attitude they're above reproach? I'll do the criticizing. Your job is to correct the trouble in this house without comment. Aren't you being a little high-handed, Mrs. Martin? You're questioning me. I certainly am. First, you practically kidnapped me and my two partners. You didn't have to come if you didn't choose... How did you know we were arriving by plane at Burbank this evening? Read it in the paper. But did you stop to consider that we might have had plans of our own? They weren't important. You mean they weren't important to you? I'm afraid you're a woman who's used to having her own way. I'm afraid I am. Well, you go right ahead and have it. Well, I think Doc and Reggie and I'll be on our way. Fiddlesticks. What's that? You're staying right here. Against our will? Nonsense. You're staying here because you're needed. You're asking us to stay? I'm ordering you to stay. Now, then I'll say goodbye. Don't be a fool, Jack Packard. We don't take orders. You walk out of the house because I order you to stay instead of ask you to stay. That's right. You'll be well paid for obeying my orders. Keep your money. As a matter of fact, our one purpose in coming to Hollywood was to spend our reward money from the last job. It would melt faster down here than any place we could think of. You don't recognize authority and you have no use for money. That's right. You're a difficult young man to handle. Not at all. We enjoy doing favorites. The House of Martin does not accept favors. Now, that's up to you. For generations, we've been able to pay for anything we want. In my opinion, then, the Martins have wanted few of the good things in this world. Bah! Well, there we are. We can't agree, so we'll go. No. Yes. No, wait a minute. Well? I don't like it. I'm not used to asking people to do things. But I will. I'm asking you to stay and help me, Mr. Packett. Please? What's that? You didn't say please. How dare you? Don't if you don't want to. Young whippersnapper. (laughs) Mr. Packard, will you please stay and help me? Gladly. In fact, we'd already made up our minds to stay. I think you've got an interesting problem here. Hmm. What do you know about the problem here? Nothing. But it's apparent there's something. It's in the atmosphere. Something, might I say, something creeping through this house. Creeping? Creeping? A creeping, unhealthy menace. What are you talking about? I don't know. You don't suppose it would be the stench of a decaying family tree that's permeating the environment, do you? Oh, such utter nonsense. We spent enough time. Come along in the library and meet my granddaughters. Very well. (laughs) Decayed family tree, indeed. Only a suggestion. Uncalled for. Come on in. Yes. Now then, Faye... Where is Hope? Oh, Grandmother, whoever keeps track of our beautiful Hope. Hmm. Well, someone should. I hate to be the one assigned to the job. I told her to be in the library at eight. Grandma, I know where she is. Cherry, shut up. Faye, please, you're a Martin, and that Martin women are always ladies. Oh, horse feathers. The Martin women are always ladies. Now then, Cherry, where is Hope? She sneaked out with the chauffeur again. You little rat. Faye. Well, she is. I am not. Hope should leave the chauffeur alone, and you know it. Well, that man will get his walking papers tonight. (laughs) Let's see. That'll make the fourth chauffeur to get his bounce in three months. We'll not discuss the subject any further. Mr. Packard. Yes? This is my oldest granddaughter, Faith Martin. Sure. We met before. Yes, I think I've had the pleasure. What's that? Miss Martin was in the car that met us at the airport tonight. You were? Why? I just wanted to get first look at your private detectives. I don't particularly like that term, private detectives. Well, isn't that what you are? Three flatties in plain clothes to keep an eye on the Martin girls. That will be enough of that, Faith Martin. And, uh, look, Packard. Grandma's the only one who can get away with Faith. Make it Faye or don't talk to me. I remember. All right, you've had the center of the floor long enough. You know Charity Martin already. Not Charity, Grandma, please. Cherry. Miss Cherry Martin. Any bad results from your fall downstairs? (laughs) Don't tell me Cherry fell downstairs again. I didn't fall. I didn't. (laughs) I was pushed from behind. And when you looked around, there wasn't anyone there. How can you look around when you're falling? Faye, let your sister alone. If she keeps falling down the stairs much more, we can make a tumbler out of her and put her in the circus. Faye. (laughs) Okay, why not? Miss Martin. You'd better call me Faye. There are too many Miss Martins around this joint. Very well, Faye, then. 
You don't seem to take your sister's convictions that someone is trying to kill her very seriously. Oh, Cherry's just got a persecution complex. I have not. Sure you have. You're always talking about them being after you. They want to kill you. They. What's that but a persecution set up? Perhaps. But how do you account for the marks of physical violence? That's not in the mind. Ah, you've got me, pal. But if there's anybody in this house chasing Cherry with malice or forethought, then... I'm a flagpole sitter. Faye, I find the vulgarity of your language exceedingly distasteful. (laughs) Poor Grandma. She's tried so hard to make ladies of us all. And what did she get? (laughs) What did she get? You really like to know? Faye, watch your tongue. I assure you I would. I'd like to know very much. Well, I'll start with me. I'm the oldest. I'm the vulgarian of the family. Faith Martin, you mind what you say? Oh, go lay down, Grandma. You begin to understand, Mr. Packard. You see why I need help so badly? Go on, Faye. You're the Bulgarian. Correct. Hope is the family wench. Witness her evening escapade with the chauffeur. Faye, the family name. What family name? And Cherry, the little whispering mouse here. Uh, She's just a plain dope, afraid of her own shadow. I see. That's the way you analyze the situation. That's us. Here we are. Look us over. What about Brother Job? We'll not discuss Job. He's a fine young man. The only one in the family who appreciates the name of Martin. Um, that's Grandma's version. Want to hear mine? Please. Brother Job is a good-natured drunk. Hey. Who's been taken by every jip game Hollywood can think of and is slowly breaking his grandmother's heart. If I may offer an opinion, I don't think you girls are doing your grandmother's heart any good either. Oh, well, she doesn't love us. As long as we don't get the name of Martin in the headlines, she doesn't mind us, but she loves Job something awful. We all do. We all love Job. And he's in such danger. He and Hope are in terrible danger. Yes, you said that before tonight when I was bandaging up your arm. Bandaging her arm? Hello. You have got a bandage on, haven't you? What happened? Somebody slashed me as I was walking down the hall. What? It's true, it's true. You you mean somebody slashed you with a knife right here in this house? Honest, Faye. Honest, they did. And Mr. Packard... Do you suppose there really is somebody after her? There's evidence to indicate it. Look, Mouse, maybe I've been doing you an injustice. It's true enough. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's take that up later. We've got away from our subject. Oh, yes, which was Job, the family drunk. You say he's in danger, Cherry. What sort of danger? I don't believe there's any truth in it. Who would want to harm Job? Besides, the child's been forewarning doom for members of the family for years. But he is in danger. He and Hope. What sort of danger? Danger out there. Outside the house. But it's getting closer. It's getting closer all the time. Creeping. Creeping. Cherry, stop saying that. I think that's the expression I used before we came in here, wasn't it, Mrs. Martin? Yes, and I forbid its use again. Well, at least Cherry and I seem to have the same intuitive sense of impending danger. How nice for Cherry. What do you mean? But you and she have something in common. I wonder if you couldn't find something in common with me, too. Such as? Well... I like my initials embroidered on my pajamas. I don't wear pajamas. Oh, how exciting. (laughs) Then you'd have to have your initials tattooed on your chest, wouldn't you, (laughs) Mr. Packard? Yes? I forbid you to indulge in conversation of this nature with my granddaughters. It seems to be the only language Faye understands. I forbid it. You know, Mrs. Martin, you seem to dominate everyone and everything except your grandchildren. Why is that? I can tell you why. She did dominate us when we were little and couldn't help ourselves. She made such hateful little prigs out of us, it was shameful. You were nice children. You bet. Nasty nice. And then one day, Job found out about fire water, and now he's devoting his life to it. And one day, I found out that there are some wonderfully disgusting words in the English language for self-expression. I'm devoting my life to them. And Hope discovered chauffeurs, and she's devoting her life in that direction. And what about Cherry here? Oh, poor little mouse. She hasn't discovered much of anything yet, so she's devoting her life to being afraid. I am not. I'm not afraid. If they weren't always after me, I wouldn't ever be afraid. They have been after her for a long time. But uh, now if they've come to life and are starting to cut her up, it may be getting serious. Yes, I'm beginning to wonder. By the way, are any of you girls married? Married? I should say not. Is Job? Certainly, Job's not married. Then who's the parents of the baby we heard crying earlier? Baby crying? You heard a baby crying? Certainly. 
Just before Cherry here fell downstairs. What did I tell you? What did I tell you? It's impossible. What are you talking about? There's not a baby in the house. There hasn't been for years. But I've heard it. I've heard it. So she says. Yes. And every time it cries, something horrible happens. <laughs> transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery, Transcribed. telling you, the more I see of this setup, the more I wish we'd gone on about our own business. Jock, that isn't like you. What ain't like me? Why, here we are guests in a millionaire's home with three beautiful girls and only their grandmother to watch over them. And what a grandma. Boy, I don't like her. (laughs) Doc's had it in for Grandma Martin since she sent us back up here to our quarters right after dinner. Yeah, what'd she do that for? She think you're the only one in our outfit good enough to associate with the Martin family? I can tell you why. Well, I wish you would. She said she wanted me to have a serious discussion with her granddaughters, and if there were too many eligible young men in the room, the girls wouldn't think of anything else. Did she really say that, Jack? She did. And when I said man crazy, she jumped all over me. Well, these just plain ain't the kind of girls that I want to associate with. Not from what I've seen of them. She ain't got nothing to worry from me. Well, they have money. Well, so have we. 25,000 bucks reward money. And what I want to know is why we don't ditch this joint and get to spending it. That'll have to wait. Yeah, on what? On the solution of the trouble that's breaking about this old grandmother's head. Well, that ain't our hard luck. I'm afraid it is. Now. Why? Because Mrs. Martin's begged us to stay and help her out. I say, that haughty, stiff-necked female aristocrat begged you to stay here? That's right. So you can see how desperate she must be. But what's the matter? What are we supposed to do? Well, none of it makes much sense yet. But I've got some tangled information. You want to hear it? Naturally. Now, throw me that other pillow, Reggie. I don't. Yeah. Thanks. Well, come on. Settle down and let's have it. All right. Now, let me give you a picture of the people in this house. Oh, you've seen them all now. No, I've only seen Grandmother Martin and two of the girls, Faye and Cherry. Faye described the others. First, Faye, or Faith, is the eldest. She describes herself as the vulgarian of the family. Oh, I say. The, the what? Vulgarian. She shocks her Puritan grandmother every time she opens her lips. On the other hand, I have a good idea that she has more gray matter than all the rest of the family put together. Mm, good looking? Yes, apparently all the Martin girls are extraordinarily beautiful. Well, that's Faye, the Bulgarian. The next girl is Hope. Hope wasn't in on the conference tonight, although she'd been told to be there by her grandmother. Yeah, where was she? Sneaked out with the chauffeur. Hey, I say, one of the Martin girls? Yes, according to Faye, this will be the fourth chauffeur to lose his job in three months on account of Hope. Faye's name for Hope is the family wench. Well, no wonder Grandmother Martin is upset. Faye, the Bulgarian, Hope, the family wench. And now we come to Cherry. Quite. And, uh, what is Cherry? Well, Faye calls her Cherry the Terrified Mouse. Hey, that ain't so bad. She ain't spoke above a whisper since we come into the house. Uh, are they still after her? Well, there's no doubt that she has an obsession that someone's after her. But it looks like with good reason. But you you, uh, you you mean you think somebody in this house really is trying to kill her? Well, I don't know whether they're trying to kill her, but they certainly are keeping her in a continual sweat of terror. In what way, Jack? 
The first slashing her arm, second pushing her down that flight of stairs. Oh, Grandma didn't take that very serious. Neither did Faye at first. When she heard it, she said, oh, so the terrified mouse fell downstairs again. Again? Yes, looks like it was a common occurrence. But then I put in my two cents worth and scared the living daylights out of both Faye and Grandma. Well, what would you want to scare them for? I didn't mean to. It wasn't until after I'd said it and saw their reaction that I knew it meant anything. Well, come on. Uh, what did you say? I said I heard a baby crying just before Cherry fell downstairs. Who does it belong to? Well, what's so terrifying about that? Whose infant is it, Jack? And uh, where's the nursery? There isn't any nursery. And there isn't any baby. Why, Dad busted, Jack, there is too. We heard it. There isn't any baby in this house. You, you're being serious? I mean to say, we did hear it. Well, Jerry's been hearing it for some time now. She says every time the baby cries, something terrifying happens. You mean a baby's haunting this house? I don't mean anything of the kind. Then what do you mean? I don't know. I'm just stating what I've heard. Jerry's been complaining of hearing a baby crying in the house and that every time she hears it, something vicious happens. The rest of the family have laid it to delusions. Oh, but see here, Jack, what we heard was no delusion. That's just the point. That's what frightened Faye and Grandma. The fact that we heard the baby proves that Cherry hasn't been talking through her hat. Doggone. Who ever heard of a house being haunted by a baby? Rubbish. Well, there it is, ain't it? A baby's voice and no baby. It's a plot. A plot, huh? Well, didn't Jack just get through saying that the kid cried just before something bad happened? Mm, that's what that girl Cherry says. And what she says is true on account, looky. We heard the baby cry, and then right after that, she was pushed downstairs. Quiet, I grant you that. Well, okay. Y you mean to tell me whoever's doing all this is running around this house with a baby in his arms, uh, pinching it to make it cry just before he gets ready to, to do some of his dirty work? Well, that's pretty silly, Doc. Well, of course it's silly. That's just what I'm saying. Besides, there ain't no baby in the house. So what? So it's got to be a baby ghost. Oh, for the love of Peter. Well, it has, Dad. Blast it. A baby ghost in this house on account of there's so much trouble and so many things is wrong. And every time that something else starts to go wrong, it, it it tries to warn folks by crying just before it happens. Beautiful theory. Well, you think of a better one. Why? Okay, okay. The trouble with you and Reggie is that you wouldn't know a ghost if it come up and... And, and laid and... an egg in my hat? <laughs> That's just plain vulgar. <laughs> Why? Because ghosts don't lay eggs. Oh. Well, they don't. Oh, right, all right. Now, do you want to hear the rest of my story? Well, what about this baby cry? That's all there is. You know as much about it as I do. And that also brings us up to date on Cherry. Oh, Cherry, the uh, terrified mouse. Hope, the family wench. And Faye, the Bulgarian. And the last on our list is Joel. Mm. Oh, that's brother, huh? Yes, in age he comes between Faye and Hope. According to Faye, he's the one who's breaking Grandmother Martin's heart. Mm. And uh, has Faye a name for him, too? Yes, Joel the good-natured drunk. Drunk, huh? And what does Grandmother Martin say about that? She tried to keep his name out of the conversation, said he was the only one worthy of the family name. Faye, on the other hand, says he's never sober and has been taken by every crook and confidence man in Hollywood. Just a never-end and easy mark, huh? Looks like it. And Grandma's always paying out and covering up for him, for the good of the name of Martin. Oh. When are we going to meet him? I don't know. When he comes home, I suppose. Where is he now? I tried to find out. No one seemed to know. Faye suggested some night spot with a well-stocked bar. I say, nice boy. Ah, company. Sit still. Listen. What's the matter, Jack? Nothing. Just wait. I say, whimsy. I get it. Hello. Why, you little wench. Oh, you've been talking to Faye. Reggie, toss me a blanket. What's that? A blanket, a blanket. <laughs> Not a wet blanket, I hope. Well, just toss it. There, I'll put this around you. You don't like me this way. No. They cost a lot of money at the best shops. Okay, so they cost a lot of money. Now, come on in. Why didn't you like them? Handmade and imported French lace. Now, keep that blanket around your shoulder. Here, sit down. What's it, Amy? <laughs> I almost sat on the floor. Drunk again. <laughs> Don't tell Grandma. I never had a drink in my life. Oh, it's queer. No smell of liquor on her breath. She's as sober as we are. I say, Jack, who is this? Who am I? Yes. No, no, wait. I'll give you a clue. I'm not Faith and I'm not Charity. Now, who am I? Your Hope. That's right. Why'd you knock on our door if you don't know who we are? I saw a light. Thought I ought to investigate. In long black stockings and a wisp of lace? Imported French lace. Where have you been? No, no, no. Mustn't tell. Scandalous. Ruin the family name. Out with the chauffeur, won't you? Shh, don't let Grandma hear. Come on, now you're not drunk. Where's your dress? <laughs> I said, where's your dress? <gasps> what dress? Look here, Hope. You want me to shake your shoes off? Where did you leave your dress? You didn't want me to wear a dress with blood on it, did you? Hey, what did you say? Of course not. Nobody wants to wear a dress with blood on it. It's ugly. 
doesn't match the color scheme. Oh, listen to me. What kind of a dress were you wearing? Slip-on, slip-off dress. I always wear slip-on, slip-off dress. I mean, what was the material? What color? Green. My favorite color. Green flowers. Now then, where'd you leave it? <laughs> Slipped out of it in the dark downstairs. Tossed it to Bob. Bob's a good egg. He'll get rid of it. Nobody ever find it. Who's Bob? Best chauffeur Martin family ever had. Is he home? Did he bring you home? Yep. Bang, bang. Man shot dead right across our table. I got blood on my dress, so Bob says, Quick, let's get the ten-letter word out of here. <laughs> I always say ten-letter word for swearing. Doc, Reggie, I want you to go down and find the chauffeur. I don't. Bring him here? If you come, anyway, get Hope's dress back. Uh, Jack. Yeah? Look, look at her right leg. Hmm? There's something on her stocking. Looks like blood, all right. There is. Here, keep that blanket on. <laughs> Unfasten your stocking. Let her slip down. Oh, naughty. Crazy little fool. There's been murder. Do you want the evidence splattered all over you? Yeah, that's better. Well, what are you two standing there for? Well, if, if Hope could tell us where the chauffeur's quarters are. Chauffeur's quarters? Over garage. Chauffeur's quarters? Always over garage. I know. Come on, Doc. Yeah, okay. Hey, hey, what's that? Listen. The baby. The baby. The baby. Stop that. Jack, there's just got to be a baby in this house. <coughs> Jack, I say. <coughs> which way did that scream come from? Down the stairs. Down the stairs. Well, come on. The baby, and, and then something happens. Down the stairs, this way. The baby, and then something happens. The baby, just stop saying that, Doc. Now, oh, there she is. There in the chair. I say, who is she? Mrs. Faye. Faye. Faye, what's the matter? Uh, up, up there by the hall entrance. He's dead. He's dead. Dead? Who's dead? The chauffeur. The chauffeur. And he's got Hope's dress. All over with blood. <laughs> Further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. The Thing That Cries in the Night, chapters 3 and 4. Here's something that... Uh, you might remember that I played on the show, if you've heard the show before. Had to do it in its censored version, but it's very much uh, an homage to the old classic party record called The Farting Contest. This is a sort of an updated version of that by the Diupers. This is called Duel at Del Santos on the Brain Sandwich Show. That's better! Now that I got your attention... I'm looking for a guy who goes by the name of Big Mutty, the Fart King. Go on, kid, well, you got the chance. Yeah, he eats young punks like you for breakfast. Yeah, you'll be the breakfast of champions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah boys, don't mess with Mutty. I said, I'm looking for that yellow-livered, egg-sucking, mangy dog who calls himself Big Mutty, the Fart Queen. <laughs> hey, hey, boy, I'm over here. Hey, what the hell you want? Oh, no. You're in for it now. Why don't you turn around and go home to your mama, sissy boy, before you get hurt? Because you ain't worth the energy for me to get off this bloody bar stool. Now get your little candy butt going. Yeah, you sissy fruit huh? can't go. Look at those fancy ducks. <laughs> yeah, he looks like a fairy to me. <laughs> I come a long way to meet you, big mutty. I got to tell you something. I hate it up here. The U.P. You know, this place is full of stinking old stupid people. That goes for everybody in this place here. You're on nothing but a bunch of dumb farmers and lumberjacks. And your youper beer sucks too. Kill him! Rip his eye out! Hold on, hold on there, boy. No one cuts down youper beer. 
You got my dandruff up. I'm gonna have to teach you a lesson, you little candy pants. Okay, Big Mutty. You're going down. They're gonna call you Little Mutty the Fart Queen when I get through with you. <laughs> okay, boys. Looks like we got ourselves a duel. Yeah. Let's make some room here. Clear space. Come on, move. Come on, Give these Mutty. boys some fight room. Okay, now, boys. I'll be keeping score. No low blows. Punching. No kicking. No biting. Huh? Okay, kid. Get up, Mutty. You're the challenger. You yeah. get to go first. All right. Show them what you got. Okay. Three trouser rippers, 25 points. Three more trouser rippers, 25 points. One, two, three. Three fizzers in rapid succession, 15 points. Ooh, an air biscuit, perfectly executed, 20 points. Okay, kid, you all played out now? Not me. What am I saying? The kid's not done yet. That was a rack mark. A rack mark is only worth two points, but it's a very dangerous move, guys. Five more rack marks. That's ten points. That's a dangerous move because of the danger of crapping. That's all I need. Oh, the kid's signaling. That's all I need to He's win. all done. Not bad for a rookie. Okay, Mutty, it's your turn. You got 97 points to beat. No problem, no problem. Yeah, this is going to be a piece of cake. Piece of cake. All right, Mutty, let him rip. Three turn honkers, 60 points. No wonder he's the king. You got it. Four mud ducks in a row. No, that's 15 points. That's a five-point buck snort. Flawless with a vanilla aftertaste. A most difficult maneuver without flotching. No, no, no. What an incredible combination. Three buttered popcorns and two points each. And a foghorn worth ten points. Making Mutty's total 96. A popper worth one point. The contest is tied. All Mutty needs now is one point to win. Wait, give me some time to get some air here. Okay, okay, here we go. Come on, Mutty. Come on, Mutty. Come on, Mutty. Come on. Come on. Mutty. Come on. Oh. Time's up, Mutty. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, gee. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Okay, we have a tie here. Oh. We're going into sudden death. Each man is allowed one fart. May the best fart win. Okay, kid, you're the challenger. You go first. Okay, Mutty. You're about to become the fart queen. You're going down. I got something saved up for you that you ain't gonna believe, boy. I brought this one all the way from down there. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. He's pushing for the big one. His veins are popping out of his face. Oh, wow. He shit himself. The kid is disqualified. Monkey's the winner. All right, Monkey. Monkey, you're the kid. You're the kid. I'm beautiful. Customer service, can I help you? I'm sorry, what service? Uh, this is the main switchboard. How would you like me to connect your call? Oh, I'm sorry, I must have the wrong number. Who, who are you calling for? I don't know, it's one of those psychic hotlines. Are, are you them? I can transfer you. Did you call the, the psychic or for the terror card? Uh, I think it was the card. Okay, I transfer it to the, uh, the reader. Can you hold, please? You sure. Call, first call is free. Okay. Okay, please hold. Oh, I'm the same guy. I feel safe with that. Turn the team down. Yeah, that Willie, can I help you? I'm sorry? I said, this Willie, can I, how can I help you? You want to get a reading? Yeah. Yeah, where you call from? Uh, Florida. Okay, let me see here. You a, you a southern boy. Yep. You a southern guy. I, see, I knew that. I knew that. 
What else? Your name start with a C. With a C? Yeah. No. Nope. I mean a, a B. Nope. Uh, a G. <laughs> no. Your uh your name start with a W. No. Uh, I'm oh I'm sorry. No, I see it now. Let me turn over this card. Your name start with a P. A B. A P. A P. No. Uh, an A. Nope. A D. Well, that's okay. We only got about 15 letters your, left. Your name Dave? No. Uh. Well, let me help you out. My name is... Oh, oh, I was looking at the wrong card. That's Oh, it. okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see you, what you want to know about. Uh, I don't know. The future. You want to know about your love life? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Well, you're going to meet a, a, a really good bitch. Go meet a good bitch. You know, you get off work, you want a good bitch, you can bring you a 40. Ain't that what you want? Well, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I never referred to a woman I was with as yeah. a bitch. You that, Just right around the corner. I, let me turn over this card. Uh, Yeah, yeah, you got yourself a, a piece of ass just around the corner. <laughs> Well, it's a good thing that or not. It's a good thing this thing well, is free well, because if I had to pay for this sh I'd be pretty upset. Hey, don't be talking this. Who the hell are you talking about? Don't be messing talking this kind of trash. I ain't playing around. Talking kind of trash. You know, I, you're you, the one you're talking gonna trash. Have to, I mean, gonna, I call then, up and I had a, I had a child the Midwest and a Bible you, Belt. You gonna I have mean, to, what if I was a God fearing person? Listen to the way you talk. I just turned over a card. You're gonna have to shine the hubcap the rest of your life. Well, that's okay. You turn over any card you want because it's all a bunch of nonsense. See, just, have, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad I'm I spoke with you because you know I was actually starting to believe some of these commercials. You're gonna shine hubcaps the rest of your Listen, life if you, you don't call you, again. You go play with your cards if you and you don't have call a real good again, life, you're okay? You're going to shine hubcaps the rest of your night. life. You're going to shine hubcaps. <laughs> Willie's Psychic Hotline. Uh, that was Junkyard Willie on the telephone. And before that, Duel at Del Santos by the Diupers. Uh, you can go to the Diupers website, diupers.com. That's D-A-Y-O-O-P-E-R-S.com. And find out more about the album that's on. It's It's the Fart Song album, I think, or something like that. But anyway, that's where you can find it and Santa's Helper and some of the other classics like Diarrhea, which, by the way, has been linked as a video on our website, so you can click on it and watch the little film that they made of it. All right, here are the Ball Busters and Sir Pete's Ticket, another one of those phone calls that I'm so fond of. Yes, I heard Miss I'd like to book a first-class ticket to Miami Beach, please. From where? From Los Angeles. What date are you traveling? As soon as possible. My wife is having an affair. The next flight out of Los Angeles is going to leave at, hmm. Yes? I'm hanging on my seat in anticipation. 6.40 in the morning. Uh, is there anything later than 6.30 in the goddamn morning? Oh, dear. Um, 10.20 a.m. out of L.A. 10.20, that's a much more godly hour, isn't it? I mean, can you believe that my wife is uh, having an affair with some poor attendant at a very expensive hotel in Miami Beach at my expense? No, I can't believe that. Well, I wish I couldn't, but I do. And i got to tell you, I am very, very upset about the whole thing. My heart is broken. The slut! The fucking whore! And how much does this ticket cost? The one-way first-class parade is going to be six eighty-six. Six eighty-six. Well, that's just a drop in the bucket, is it, compared to what I'm going to lose? Huh? Fine, fine. Put me on. What's your last name? Letterman Fortenson. Spell it. Letterman Fortenson Johnson. You have to spell it because I don't understand what you're saying. I'm sorry. L e t t e r n a n f o r t h s o n s o n. That's only one S-O-N, I repeated myself, so it's Letterman Fortin Simpson. Right, that bitch! Can't believe that she would do this! I mean, what does she think when she's receiving it? That's what I want to bloody know. How did you find out? Well, I called the hotel, and somebody else answered the phone other than my wife. My wife refused to get on the bloody phone. And I, I know! It does, I mean, I don't just think the brains of a Lloyd Bloody George to figure it out, you know? Blow or whatever his fucking name is, I don't bloody know. So this is at, what, 10.40 in the morning? 
Well, if I believe it, 1020. 1020. Good. Well, it gives me time to get up by the shower. Shit. Good. Flight 300. Right. Gonna arrive in St. Louis at 347. St. Louis? Uh-huh. You have to go through St. Louis. I've never been to St. Louis. Where the fuck is it? In Missouri. In Missouri. And I'm sure a fine caliber of person resides in Missouri. I mean, I just want to break her little legs. I can see them now, spread, sitting there on the bed, ready to go. Here he comes. It's not me. Right, right, right. I'm paying for the bloody room and the champagne and the grapes and all the other crap that she's probably feeding this this 19-year-old. And I, you know, I know she's taking it up the bum. I know she is. Because she never let me do it. Never, ever, ever. The back passage. The poop shoot. The chocolate speedway. I mean, stop me if I'm getting a little out of hand. Let me give you your record locators and you can go to the airport and purchase your ticket any time between now and your flight time. Right. Record locator would be Zulu Alpha. Wait, wait, excuse me, excuse me, I'm sorry? Z like Zulu. Zulu A Alpha? What, what, what language are you speaking about now? Mike. Mike? Oh, no. you lost your mind, woman? The, ni the number nine. Excuse me, I'm, I'm awfully sorry, but I can't understand the fucking word you're saying to me. Alpha Zulu? What is this? What, 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 what are you These are letters. These are letters. Make up your confirmation number. That make up my confirmation number. How stupid of me. I just thought you broke into some sort of Morse code over the phone for a second. How silly I should have known. Yes. Alpha Zulu, was it? Zulu Alpha. Zulu Alpha. Yes. Okay. Mike. Mike. The number nine. The number nine. Oh, like Oscar. Oh, like Oscar. S like Sam. S like slut. That's whatever happened to me giving you a credit card number and you purchasing the ticket over the phone. No, you can do that. Um, I. I mean, my name is Sir Peter Latterman Fulton Simpson. <laughs> I am a knight, my dear good woman. Her Majesty the Queen knighted me back in '87. What queen? Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth. Yes. What queen? Have some respect. The Queen of England, woman! Oh, well, you're in America. We don't have queens here. Well, you do have queens. I've seen a couple of them. Bloody puffs. <laughs> okay, well, you need to, um... Right, so I'll just go to the dick desk. The dick. I'm sorry, I've got penises on the mind, haven't I? I'll, I'll just go to the desk and I say, Alpha Zulu will have a banana and I've got my ticket. Mm-hmm. Right, we'll piss off and have a good fucking day. Hello! Yes. Yes, I said piss off and have a good fucking day. You do the same. Thank you, you slut. Hello? Hello, who's this? This is Tina. Who's this? My name's Candy, and there's no real nice way to say this, but your boyfriend's been fucking me. What in the hell are you talking about? I'm trying to tell you that your boyfriend's been fucking me. He came over to my house a couple nights ago. And, well, he raped me, and he beat me, and he had anal sex with me, and my asshole's been bleeding for days now. Well, obviously, you're very upset. But you can't expect me to believe you. Listen up. Don't be so blind, bitch. I've been balling that asshole for the past year and a half. But that's not any proof. Why would I have a reason to lie to you? I mean, if you want proof, just come over and look at my ass. I'll prove it to you. He's got a really small dick, right? Right? But that's not proof, really. I mean, since Brett and I are engaged to be married, I really, really doubt he's having an affair. Your boyfriend's name is Brett, not Alan. Yeah? I'm sorry, I have the wrong girlfriend. Uh. The 976 girls with a girlfriend, and before that, the call about Sir Pete's ticket by the Ball Busters. Okay, here's part two, how to CB. In addition to distress or mayday calls, CB channels are also used to obtain directions. When asking for assistance, always be precise and to the point. CB time is valuable to travelers, and idle talk is a nuisance. Your exact location should be given first then your desired destination. On the other hand, if you're responding to a call, the information you give must be accurate and clear. After all, the purpose of CB is to help fellow travelers, not confuse them. Listen carefully to the following dialogue. Hey, break one nine for directions one time. Hey, 
Come on, Becky, you got the Fickle Pickle here. KPC 3622, come back. Hey, Fickle Pickle, I'm just north of X-29. Can you give me some arrows to that Fallsburg Town turnoff? Hey, uh, negatory on that Fallsburg turnoff. Better make the break again. Maybe someone else can help you. Thanks anyway for the comeback, guy. Catch you on the flip-flop. Break 19, where's that beaver looking for that Fallsburg Town? Come on. Hey, Brecky, you got Little Red Riding Hood here, K-A-T-2469, looking for that Fallsburg Town guy. Come back. Yeah, Little Red Riding Hood, if you're just north of exit 29, follow this green stamp up to exit 32. That's 32. Get on the northbound, the northbound of Route 20 for one and a half miles, and you're there. You got a copy? Thanks for the info, good buddy. Come back with your handle. Uh, this here's the Big Bad Wolf, KBW 1800. Come back. Hey, thanks, Big Bad Wolf. This is Little Red Riding Hood, KAT 2469, down and on the side. I go. Bye-bye. As you get used to these CB sounds, you will notice some transmissions contain multiple information. In the following conversation between two truckers, both road conditions and a smoky report are given. Listen for key words. We'll review them later. Hey, Breaker 191 time, you've got one chicken plucker looking for a fairy tale about Papa Bear on this here green stamp north. Come back. Hey, chicken plucker, you be an 18-wheeler in this here truck em up lane? Hey, that's a big Ford guy. We be a rolling refinery that's off to old Opry land. Hey, what's your 20, good buddy? Uh, yeah, good buddy, uh, I just passed a piggyback on this here green stamp. So we got your front door, guy. It be looking clean and green up to the piggy bank for sure. Hey, you be in tune for a brown bottle at the next short short? Hey, negatory on that brown bottle, but we thank you. We be rolling heavy on the hammer all night. Got to keep the trailer trucking so my beaver will be warm between them sheets tomorrow. You got a copy? Now, that's a big 10-4. Listen, Chicka Plucker, we be sitting in to do some grocery shopping about now. Better Jake before the go-go juice. We got slick spots popping out all over this here slab. 88 surround the house till you cotton picker. We be top of those hills. KKC 3333. Down and on the side. Bye. I'm sure you noticed many new words in this exercise. For instance, fairy tale, a story, truck em up lane, the extreme right lane on the highway, roll in refinery, a truck hauling gas or oil, piggy bank, a toll booth, brown bottle, a bottle of beer, beaver. A woman. Jake. To slow down. Go-go juice. Gas or fuel. You'll want to practice these dialogues several times, reviewing the CB terms and their meanings. If you've forgotten any of the meanings of the words in the preceding dialogues, start at the beginning and try again. It'll make the following dialogues much easier to understand and more useful to you on the road. To help you get actively involved in your new CB language, try to speak all the parts of the following three dialogues with the speakers. These practice lessons will give you a feel for rhythm, and once you master that, you'll begin to develop your own style. Breaker 1-9, you got the rhinestone cowboy here. Uh, you uh, broke it, uh, now I'll fix the cowboy, come on back. Yeah, guy, this is uh, YB-1179, uh, rhinestone cowboy. <laughs> Looking to do some grocery shopping on the westbound of this number 135. Come back. Hey, guy, you're getting stepped all over. Skip down to channel 15. Channel 15. That's a big four. At this point, the two CBs switch their transceivers to channel 15. 15. Because channel 19 is very crowded. And 15 is clear. Breaker 15. You got the rhinestone cowboy again. Come back. Roger, cowboy. You're looking for a grocery store. That's a big 10-4. Yeah, guy. Uh, there's a chuck em up stop about three miles on the right. Uh, break a one five one time for that rhinestone cowboy. You there, cowboy? Uh, go, Breaker. You bought the channel. Come on. Uh, negatory on that grocery store, good buddy. They got under the sheet. That's a big 410, guy. Any other black water holes? Yeah, guy, you uh, go five miles to a smoky bear cage, turn right, and there's an eat-em-up stop about a quarter mile on the left. You got that, guy? Yeah, uh, Roger. I'm up, I'm down, I'm gone. Yeah, guy, I'm westbound looking around, 10-10 till then. Now, let's review for key words. Grocery shopping. To stop and eat. Getting stepped all over. Your transmission is being interfered with. Black water hole. A coffee stop. Smoky bear cage. A police station. 
quick when I'm for North Sonder on this here 151 time. Come on, Beaver Breaker. Hey, thanks for the comeback, guy. What's your 20? Hey, you got the monkey wrench here, KPK 1175 Melton Rubber on exit 38. What's your handle, Beaver? Hey, you got one eager beaver here headed for that old bean town. We got your back door guy at exit 36. Okay, eager beaver, we be headed for that Lone Star Ranch up in the old Granite State. You keep that back door shut good and tight now, and we'll be shaking the leaves for you. Come on. Hey, that's a big Charlie Brown guy. You got one eager beaver on the side and satisfied. Hey, 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 where's that uh, eager beaver? Hey, you got one eager beaver here. Come on back. Hey, what's happening, eager beaver? You got uh, one beaver eater here. Hey, Beaver Eater, what's your 20? Hey, I be sitting in the saddle, headed south for that dirty city. Too bad we can't get an eyeball on you. We heard tell of some evil Knievels up away on my side. Better keep an eye out in case those snakes decide to do a flip-flop. But you're looking clean and green to the piggy bank for sure. Hey, threes and eights to you, Beaver Eater. Maybe we'll catch an eyeball on the rebound. You got one eager beaver, K-A-K, 7324. We up, we down, we in and out. You get to the bean town, you give me a shout. The dialogues should be getting easier to understand, but let's not push our luck. Let's continue with the reviews. Handle. Your code or CB name. Shake the leaves, also called beat the bushes. First CB vehicle looking for police. 20. Location. Sitting in the saddle. Also the rocking chair. Middle CBer in a convoy. Evil Knievels. Motorcycle police. Eyeball, to see a fellow sea beer, or to meet him. Break one nine for all you westbounders on this big 94. We got us a granny in the middle aisle, and she just passed in the Ann Arbor exit at 46. Uh, thanks for the breaker on Grandma. We got an eyeball on her right now. Looks like she's trying out for the Turtle Olympics. Good numbers to you. Keep the shiny side up and the dirty side down. This be the big bug on the side and standing by. By this time, you're probably finding the dialogues are sounding very familiar to your ear. But there are still a few words you don't know yet. Let's review one more time. Granny. A slow driver. Good numbers to you. Best wishes. Keep the shiny side up and the dirty side down. Drive safely. One thing you'll find unique about the CB community is its constant concern for safety on the road. You may have noticed that most sign-offs remind motorists to take care and get home safely. For example, you are likely to hear... Keep your nose between the ditches and smoke you out of your britches there, now, guy. This is KPG 8765. We gone. Or possibly... Stay between the jumps and bumps there, guy. We gone. Bye-bye. One thing for sure. Every CBer knows the advantages of the highways, but at the same time remembers the careless driver can make the highway a hazard. To expand your vocabulary, here are some more CB terms frequently used on the road. Affirmative. Charlie Brown, or 10-4. Yes, I understand. Hey, guy, that's a big 10-4. Bears. Policemen. This here slab is wall-to-wall -wall bears. Beat the bushes. First car or vehicle with CB in a group, traveling in the same direction. Going a little above the speed limit, but not too fast to get a ticket. Okay, guy, I'll be beating the bushes for you. You keep that back door shut tight now. Both feet on the floor, or streaking. Driving as fast as possible. We're doing it to it with both feet on the floor. Brake. Request to use a channel. Brake one nine, brake one nine for 1036. Bumper lane. $50 or monster lane. The far left lane on the highway. There's an 18-wheeler doing it to it in the $50 lane. Beaver. Female. Hey there, come on back, beaver breaker. Buffalo. Male, often used by a beaver to refer to her husband. Hey, good buddy, thanks for the offer some black water, but I got my buffalo riding shotgun with me today. Black water. Coffee. Hey, guy, I'm going to get me some black water at that old orange roof ahead. City Kitty, local yoko, or county mounty, local police. Watch out for that old hole in the wall. We got us a local yoko on the south side. Clear and rolling. Sign off and moving. This is KKC 2469, the bumper thumper, clear and rolling. Clean and green. The road is free of police and obstructions. Hey there, guy. Put the pedal to the metal and come on, because it's clean and green all the way to that Hartford town. Convoy. 
A group of CB-equipped vehicles traveling in the same direction, keeping in constant contact with one another. Hey, guy. Welcome to the convoy on Route 15, going to the old bean town. We're glad to have you at the back door of our convoy. Do it to it. Full speed ahead. Thanks for that clean and green good, buddy. We're going to be doing it to it in the $50 lane. Down and on the side. Finish talking, but listening. This is KKC 9400, the bumper thumper down and on the side. 88s. Love and kisses. Well, there, guy, I'm going to be passing along a big stack of 88s. You've got the happy pussycat. KPC 3622. We gone. Ears. Ears on. CB radio turned on. Hey there, blue four-wheel in the truck em up lane. You got your ears on? Eyeball. Have the vehicle you're talking to within view. Hey there, four-wheeler. We got an eyeball on you. Flip-flop. Return trip or U-turn. You have yourself one fine day. We catch you on the flip-flop. Bye. Four-lane parking lot. Expressway or roadway with a traffic jam. Hey, guy, you better pull up to some double nickels, because at exit 191, you got rubbernecks that are making this here slab worse than a four-lane parking lot. Front door. First vehicle with a CB in a group, traveling together in the same direction in a convoy. Hey there, little pregnant roller skate. We're going to pull up the hammer and ride the rocking chair, so you've got the front door now. Good numbers. Best wishes. We'd be leaving you now, good buddy, and we'd be passing along all those good numbers to you. Guy, a fellow CBer. Hey, Guy, how's it looking over your shoulder? Come back. Granny, a slow driver. Watch out, good buddy. We got us a granny at exit 121, heading east on this here green stand. Grocery shopping. Stopping to eat. It's about time we do some grocery shopping up there at that old orange roof, for sure. Hammer up or hammer down. Accelerator. Gas pedal. Put the hammer down there, guy. Let's get an eyeball on each other. Home 20. Home or base station location. What's your home 20 there, Beaver? Mail. CB conversations overheard. We've been reading the mail on this here channel, and we hear that there's a county mommy at exit 21 South, so hammer up. Negatory. No. Negative answer. Hey, buddy, thanks for the offer, but we gotta say negatory on that black water stop. Pregnant roller skate. A Volkswagen. Hey, artichoke, you better hammer up at exit 33 North. You got a granny pushing a pregnant roller skate in the monster lane. Seat cover, passenger, usually a female, and an attractive one. Hey there, Mr. Minuteman. You'll want to check out the seat covers and that little yellow bug as you go by, correct? Short, short. Very soon. Restroom stop. Mercy, mercy, can somebody give me a 20 for a short, short? Step down. Transmission has been interfered with. Wall-to-wall -wall bears. Police everywhere. Hey, good buddy. We gone. Stopping transmissions and standing by. This here, KKC 2469, the careful bachelor. We gone by. As a new CBer, there are certain things you must remember before you break onto the airways. For instance, there are certain no-nos in the CB community. First and foremost is never to broadcast false information. Citizen Band Radio shall not be used for any purpose or in connection with any activity which is contrary to federal, state, or local law. It is illegal to use your CB as a sales tool. You may never sell products or charge a motorist in distress for making a help call. CB, like any other broadcast medium, does not allow the use of profanity. It is illegal to boost your transmitting power beyond the legally allowed 4 watts. Don't use Channel 9 for conversation. Channel 9 is for emergency use only. Remember, calling a false emergency is a felony. Never use your CB to transmit music, whistling, sound effects, or any material for amusement or entertainment purposes, or solely to attract attention. In addition to the CB no-nos, there are simple courtesies one should follow. When you break a channel, do not interrupt other users unless it's for an emergency. 
and a Smoky moving in the $50 lane is not an emergency. An accident in the $50 lane is an emergency. In order to apply for and receive an FCC license for CB, you must be 18, so don't let your children play with a microphone. Do not tie up a channel with idle talk. Others may need information, and they may be too courteous to interrupt your transmission. It is important to give the common courtesy of thanks whenever appropriate. A uh, break for a native of the capital city. Come on. Go ahead, break. Thanks for the break. What's your handle? This is the first mama here. Well, I thank you, first mama. When a fellow CBR asks for information or directions, do not respond unless you are very familiar with the directions you're giving. Help make his trip as short as possible. Well, good buddy, by now you know enough to try it on your own. Apprehensive? We all are at first. But there are a lot of nice folks out there in your new party line, and each has useful information to help you along the road. And yes, just one more thing to keep in mind. Used properly, Citizens Band Radio will help you and yours get home safely. So with that said, have a good gone, cotton picker. Get out there and do it to it. Hey, that's the score. This here's a Connecticut Yankee. I'm going 10-7. He's gone. He's gone by. Hey, Roger. I'm up. I'm down. I'm gone. Hey, that's a big Charlie Brown. You got one eager beaver on the side and satisfied. We'd be standing by. Goodbye. Hey, that's a big 10-4. You got one poetry man here. Tall, tan, and terrific. We up, we down, we gone. Bye-bye. That's a big 10-4. You got the foxy lady here. I down and on the side. Bye-bye. The concluding part of How to CB. Hope you found that useful. Here is the final chapter for this podcast of The Thing That Cries in the Night. This is part number five in the I Love a Mystery series. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery, transcribed. People are so dead when they're dead, aren't they? Not a very suitable sentiment for the occasion. No, no, don't touch anything. <laughs> hey, who is the Bulgarian Martin, they call? What are you doing? I'm trying to discover if there are any clues in the vicinity of this corpse that might implicate any member of the Martin family. You want to implicate one of us? No, but I want to know what we're up against before the police arrive. Why not the Marines and the Navy? The police have to be called, you know that. Why? You can't ask sensible questions, don't ask any. Whoever shot this man must have used a silencer. Otherwise, we'd have heard the shot. Mm, a good-natured drunk has a gun with a silencer. Your brother, Joe? Mm-hmm. And I still want to know why we have to call the police. Murder's the policeman's business. Not this murder. This is the Martin family's own private little bloodletting party. You think someone in this house committed the crime? Naturally. Who? First, tell me where you sent your two friends. Doc and Reggie? Mm-hmm. Ten minutes after we find the corpse with the curly hair here, they go kiting out of the house like men on a mission. The question is, where? Why? They're out scouring the nightclubs and drinking places for your brother. <laughs> Job isn't worth it. Worth what? The trouble you're taking to find him. I want to know where he is and what he's been doing tonight. I want witnesses who will swear that he hasn't been near this house all evening. Why? So that we'll be all set for the police when they start asking questions. When are the police going to start asking questions? As soon as they get here. When will they be here? As soon as I call them. And when are you going to call them? When I'm satisfied I know as much about this situation here as they'll be able to find out. Aren't you obstructing justice or something? I mean, waiting about notifying them? Maybe. Now then, why do you think this man was killed by someone in the house? Because almost everyone in the house had a reason. Everyone had a reason to want to kill the chauffeur? Was he that important to this house? I hope to tell you. Bob the chauffeur, now Bob the corpse, was putting the screws on the Martins. In what way? Well, let's start at the top of the list and work down. First grandma, blackmail to hush scandal concerning Job and Hope. What sort of scandal? Job and a girl. <laughs> Job hates girls, so I know it was a frame, but it was good enough to make headlines in the paper. Well, what about Hope? Hope can't let chauffeurs alone. Hope, the family wench, was so deeply involved with our new cadaver here that one word from him and the whole world would know what she is. By the way, right this minute, Hope is upstairs asleep in my room. <laughs> oh, a gentleman wouldn't tell. Now, don't be a fool. <laughs> we left her in our room and we heard you scream and rush downstairs. Went up a few minutes ago, she'd crawled into my bed and was fast asleep. Maybe you'd like...